Hey everybody, so today we are going to be talking about why I think Protege is one of the most underrated taxonomy tools that is free out there on the market right now. Now I know there are others that are on the free to lower price range listed here, but the reason that I really like Protege is what we're gonna talk about in this video. I have used this for probably 15 years off and on for different taxonomy management processes. So if this is something that you are struggling with and maybe you're just using Excel right now and maybe you see some of the bigger ticket tools out there and they're just not in your price range or you just don't have the staff or the resources to get them up to speed, Protégé might be a good alternative for you to look into. So in this video, I'm going to be walking through some of the main criteria that you would need to use a taxonomy management tool for, and we're gonna see how Protege stacks up to that. I'm also gonna share some of my tips and tricks on where you can shore up Protege where it maybe doesn't do exactly what you need for taxonomy management. So if this sounds interesting to you, keep on watching. All right, so the very first thing that we are going to cover is you know, taxonomy, metadata, and setup. So this is the overall provenance and information that you want to be able to track on your taxonomy as a whole. So the first thing you'll see are the suggested plugins. Uh, for this, I'm not gonna go into too many of these. Most of what we need for taxonomy management is actually already uh, installed when you get protege so i will have another video all about the plugins for protege what they are good for which ones i would recommend that is going to be linked down below whenever that comes out all right so the very first thing we're going to do is name our taxonomy and you know one way you can do that is in the iri so we're just going to name it testing uh tax And we have our version, this is V1. And here's where you can put some additional metadata, such as I have added the DC creator uh, attribute. And you do that by adding a property like this and you add it in. And I'm going to say creator is Ashley Faith. And then, you know, some of the best practices, you know, add in what is this taxonomy used for? What are some of the past uh, either versions or owners or, you know, vocabularies that were used to uh, map into this? That sort of thing. You can put all of that in your annotations. But let's go up to our settings. So that's under the protege, um, like next to file. And you're going to hit settings. And here we're going to say, now I don't know where yours is, is going to start, but I was under user details last, so that's why that tab opened for me. So here I'm going to put my username so that anything that I do, it will show as I am the one doing it. Um, you can connect this to Git, which is absolutely amazing, or you can put in your ORCID ID if you are in the research space. This is, I love that they've added things like this because um, this this gives, <laughs> it was already legitimate, but this is really cool that some of those things are being added in now. Um, and this is to basically say, what who is the user, i.e. you, that is um, working in this space? So any of the change logs is going to have your information. For new entities, this is where you can actually create the IDs, the unique IDs associated with every uh, entity or taxonomy term in our case. And so um, you can use the active ontology, which is what we were just editing. Um, you can specify what you want to use. So okay, that is going to be, let's say our the, the beginning of our, our ID, we're going to say we're gonna follow by the pound symbol. And um, right now it's going to end with the supplied name, which is going to be the label that we add in as metadata for our taxonomy terms. Or you can have an auto-generated ID. 
And that's where you can get into more of these details if you really wanna use this as generation of UIDs. Now, UID does not necessarily mean UID across all of your vocabularies. It means that in this vocabulary, the uh, system is going to make sure that it is unique. So just keep that in mind. So you can go in and you can update these. For, for now, just to make it easier to read, I'm going to use the user supplied name, which is gonna be our label. Log, um, this is just your change log and you can go in and this is great for reporting. You can change how you want to uh, track those things. In the general, um, this is where you can add expand trees by default. I find that really helpful when I am editing a taxonomy because you don't want to have to keep, especially when you have a very deeply nested vocabulary, it's super annoying to have to open up each of the trees. Um, and then you can adjust how many of the levels you want to go. I always have allow drag and drop in trees because that is one of the main criteria for a traditional taxonomy management tool. Um, search type, right? So you can search for different terms. In this example, we're not going to have a very uh, large vocabulary, but if you did have a large vocabulary, you might want to go in here and add in different search types. Okay, renderer is... Um, this is super helpful for when you're actually doing the editing where you can actually change if you want your vocabulary to be rendered on the screen by the ID, the prefix name, and annotation. So that would be like RDF labels, pref labels, since we are going to be using SCOS, which is a vocabulary specific standard. Um, we can use pref label because we will be using pref labels in this vocabulary. So you can go ahead and, and update this to your preferences. But for vocabularies, I usually use render by annotation and I usually use pref label. Uh, and then new entity metadata. So I have this as selected. Every time I add a new entity, it will add in the creator, which was our user details. So it'll say uh, my my initials. And the property is going to be in as creator, and that's a, a DC, you can see that here, DC element. But again, this is very ontology based. So if you don't wanna use Dublin core, you can just have your own field name here if you would like. And you can see here, I could use ORCID ID, but I don't have that entered from my user details, so don't worry about that. Um, and then I also have it as a creation date is automatically applied and you can change that to, uh, you, I have it as an ISO or you can have it as a, as a timestamp. All right, so those are the main setup pieces. All right, so now we're on the classes tab and there's a bunch of different tabs here. We'll just go through them quickly. Classes are going to be your taxonomy terms and metadata. Your object properties are going to be if you need to have a unique relationship. So normally taxonomies have uh, use for high, uh, parent and child relations. Those are parent and child are hierarchical. Use for is a um, alt label, but then you also have see also and see also, and this is where you would put that in. That doesn't mean you have to keep it as see also. If you have a very specific edge, why one thing is related to another, here is where you would be able to enter that in. So um, these are going to be uh, symmetrical. So what that means is each of your um, relations between things in an ontology are, are usually directed, right? It goes one way or another. Symmetric means it goes both ways. The line will go both ways. So what that means is cat means kitty, kitty means cat. That's, that's a symmetric. So here we're going to add in C also. And you'll see here that my creator tag has been added. My time has been added. And then I'm going to make this symmetric. Cool. All right. So I have created a uh, custom relation. Then we also have annotation properties. So I had created DC creator in here, but we also can put in 
all of the um, annotation or fields. And this is where you can make this as custom as you would like. So if you have 20 additional fields for stock shelf or price difference or whatever it is that you need to have any kind of metadata that you want, you can add that as an annotation and then you can populate it just like any other taxonomy management tool. In fact, some taxonomy management tools don't allow you to make your own field. So that's why I do like this. Um, and then what is also nice is you can add descriptions and who created and all of those kinds of metadata pieces to your fields as well, which I'm not going to do here. Um, but I, I strongly recommend that you do that in a real taxonomy. So let's go ahead and add in some SCOS uh, fields, basically. And so I'm going to actually do this properly with SCOS since it is something that is defined. Pref label. And you can see here that uh, the IRI got updated to SCOS because it actually knows that as a standard that is pre-built. Okay. We're going to also add SCOS alt label. Okay. And these are all very standard for taxonomies. That is why I'm adding the ones that I'm adding. SCOS definition. Scope note. And by the way, if you're using Web Protege, um, which is particularly helpful if you are doing collaboration, uh, these are already in there. They're they're auto populated. So you wouldn't have to do this if you're using Web Protege. And then for good measure, I'm going to add in just a really custom, I'm going to say Acme. And so you'll see this one, SCO's hidden label, does not have any annotations auto-populated. The reason for that is because it exists as a standard and Protege recognizes that. Whereas this does not have anything um, standardized. That's just something that is unique to my taxonomy. And so it is going to document that these are created by an individual. All right, so now that we're back into classes, we are going to show the bread and butter of the taxonomy management tool, which is creation, renaming, moving, deleting, and merging. So we'll go through each of those. So let's just create a real quick vocabulary. We're going to say, um, going to make it pizza. So let's say pizza type. And you can see here it is auto generating uh, my unique ID. Again, this is not really an ID, so you'd want to make it a real ID, but that's what we have for this demonstration. So pizza type, and then toppings. And and then maybe under toppings, let's create um, sauce. And we're going to make a few types of sauces. One is called Cali. Oops, we don't want that to be a child. And Chicago. And New York. Okay, those are our sauce types. And you can see as I create these, these are getting the creator and the, the date tags. And it's also um, creating a hierarchy for me because of how it's situated here. So that is creating. Now let's rename something. So let's say um, I don't really want Cali, or no, let's say New York. New York, I want to uh, change the name. So I would go up to refactor, rename entity, and I would say NYC instead. Maybe that's what I want. Now, if I had linked this anywhere else in the vocabulary, I would click this and it would update them everywhere. Um, but I don't need that right now. So I'm just going to say yes. And you'll see it has now been renamed. Wonderful. So let's say I'm moving around in the vocabulary and I create something called uh, thin crust. 
and I say, oh no, I put it in toppings. That is not a topping, that is a type of crust. So I can just drag it up and move it to crust and there you go. It is now part of crust and you can see the metadata and the hierarchy has been updated. So that's moving. If I want to delete something, so uh, let's add something silly like mushy, gross. You can go up here and you can delete and it will delete it through the whole vocabulary. So if you've mapped it or linked it anywhere, um, it will delete all of them or you at least have the option to delete all of them. And now let's look at merging. So let's add another sauce empire and go, oh, wait a minute. Empire and New York are actually the same sauces. So now we need to merge these two together. So each has a different timestamp, first of all, but let's add a little bit more metadata so you can see what this merge would look like. So over here, I'm just going to add, um, let's just add a comment. Oops, didn't mean to add this. Okay, I'm gonna say, great. You can see in here, oops, didn't mean to add this. Now we're going to say in NYC, we're going to say yum. Okay. So you can see yum. And over here, you can say, see what I did. Now let's say I want to merge Empire with NYC. So I'm going to select what I want to merge. I'm going to go up to edit. I'm going to go down to merge into entity. And I'm going to say NYC. Okay, so we've selected NYC, and I'm gonna say yes. So now you'll notice that our old one went away, our empire, and you can see both of the comments, because that was the main difference, although there is a date difference of creation, have now been merged. So that is how you merge things. Be very careful doing that because you can see I don't see anything about Empire anymore. I mean, if you look at the change logs, um, you'll be able to see that. So let's go look at changes. You can pop that down here. You can see here that I did a whole bunch of changes here. So you can actually look at the change logs. So now I'm gonna get, eh, I'll just leave this there. Those are fine. Um, although you can go in and edit and delete these. What we're gonna do next is we're going to talk about the, the hierarchy. So you can see that I've been creating a hierarchy here, but now let's say these sauces are also pizza types because the sauce, is is connected to pizza type well i don't want to go down here and add duplicates because these are the types of sauces that go with the pizzas so what i can do is right here where it says subclass of i can add and i can say pizza type and make sure you're over in class hierarchy for that you add it in now it says pizza type and Guess what? Now it's in Pete's type. And this is beautiful because this is poly hierarchy because this is the same entity. It's just showing up in two different parts of the hierarchy. And so let's go ahead and do that for the rest of these. We'll move into the next part, which is actually adding the metadata to each of these. So here we're going to do pref label first. And so this is the KA, so for California, yum, yum pizza okay and going to press all right and then you can see here the scos label is ca yum yum pizza and you'll notice over here that is now what is being displayed and the reason for that is because when we uh set up the view the rendering of our our vocabulary it's going off of the pref label so if I changed any of these to have a pref label, their, their label will, will get updated here too. You can change that. So 
if you want these to be true IDs and you still want to be able to see the the human the human readable, you can always change the rendering as pref label. Okay, so now we have a pref label, and now we're going to add in um, the alt label, which is what we started with, which was Cali Pizza. That's an alt label, which means it would be more readily used uh, where people could see it. <clears throat> and then another, but similar, is hidden label, which is uh, <laughs> Valley, Valley PZ. So let's say that's like the slang word for this this thing and that's why we're going to make it a hidden label it's it's hidden labels are usually for slang or misspellings and and things like that so then we'll have that let's add in a definition uh pizza with garlic and basil sauce vegan cannot be sub so substituted now this is important because it gets confused a lot in taxonomy and that is the definition and scope note are two different things the part of this that is not a definition is this part cannot be substituted which is more a direction to whoever is using the taxonomy or how you can use this tag when it shows up. So if somebody sees anyone ordering the CA Yum Yum pizza, then uh, they know they can't substitute anything on it. So we're gonna take that out. So we're gonna say yes to that. And then we're gonna add a scope note, which is what we just said, cannot be subbed. And the reason you wanna distinguish these is because scope notes are used by human and machine tagging as well as any data governance. Now, the other thing is in this uh, definition, it has that this is vegan. This actually might be something, um, if it's important to your taxonomy to have um, in your actual taxonomy that it is vegan. Okay, so if we wanted to add that into our taxonomy, we'd go here, we would go here and down, Terry. And underneath that, we're going to say vegan. Oops. Go. No. All right. So we want to connect vegan to the yum yum pizza so that the note, the definition that we have, which maybe is rendered for a customer to read, we now know is for sure vegan. So let's add that. Now, depending on how you set your, up your taxonomy, you might want to have this as um this pizza listed as a type of vegan pizza but here is where we can use um, some of those unique relations so we're going to have here restriction so maybe we know when people are doing this they need to be restricted in what they're actually adding to the pizza and so we can say that and also let's let's go back to that property so we're going to say this is asymmetric, which means it's going to go in one direction. What that means is you need to start on the taxonomy term that would point to the term that the relation is going to. So you would say there's a vegan restriction on the yum yum pizza. That's one way. There is not a yum yum pizza restriction of vegan. That doesn't make sense. So you wanna start on vegan and then we're going to add so you're going to go to the subclass and we're going to say restriction. Yum, yum, pizza. And here you can say some, all. Um, so we're going to say exactly. Cardinality is one. So you can see here that we have now created this this little reaction here. Now let's look at some additional reporting. So if we want to see all of the different places that Yum Yum Pizza shows up, which we can very clearly see this is a very tiny taxonomy, um, you would actually go up here to usage and you can see 
under the Yum Yum Pizza, all of the different uh, annotations that we're using. And then you can also see that it is connected to vegan. And this is very helpful when you have a taxonomy term that shows up in a lot of different areas of your taxonomy that you can kind of track down where it is. You can do the same on object properties, right? So you can see the usage of each of these and same with annotation properties. So if you want to see all of the taxonomy terms that have stock number, which I didn't use. So let's look at definition. You can see here where it's used. And then if we go back to active ontology, you can also see all of the information on how many classes we have 11. So that's how many taxonomy terms. Then you can see how many um, parts of the hierarchy. So subclass of, and as you add more complexity to, and then you can see how many annotations. So this can be customized, but you know, this is a, a general um, way to get a view into your vocabulary. So now let's talk about collaboration. There is, not a lot of ways to collaborate just in the tool itself. So my recommendation is if you are working in a team where you need to um, be able to, one, collaborate and work on different parts of the um, taxonomy, what you can do is uh, you can use a like file check-in system. So, you know, you can do this with, I know, um, Microsoft Office, uh, Teams, and SharePoint. You can do this with other tools like Zoho or any um, file management type of thing where you basically would say, I am the taxonomist working on this today, or maybe you can break out um, individual branches of a taxonomy into separate taxonomy files. And I would be working on one part of the taxonomy. That means I check out the document, which means nobody else can go in and um, make edits. I make my edits and then I, I then check it back in and then others can work on it. Uh, there is no direct way in Desktop Protege to put in suggestions. Um, that is something, and actually both of these things, you, you can use Web Protege to do a lot of these things. Um, it's a little bit difficult to do some of the more advanced things in Web Protege, but honestly, you could use either of them. Web Protege is also really helpful for just auto populating scopes if, if that's what you're interested in. And you um, can all work on the same taxonomy at the same time. And you can also leave notes for each other. Um, if you are interested in doing things where you can suggest changes, you can also do that in Web Protege. Or you could check the file in as code into like a GitHub repo. And then, you know, you would just do the regular change and merge kind of stuff that you would do in a regular GitHub repo. So those are some of the ways that I would suggest in doing collaboration. Um, some of that is also touching on the pipeline aspect of this. Although if you host the desktop version of Protege, you can do a lot of these things yourself and connect in um, what what um, I would consider the uh, bookends of your taxonomy management tool, which is how are you um, sourcing new taxonomy terms or definitions? And then the other side of it could potentially be exporting this into a database or exporting this into search engines for search engine optimization or um, even an auto tagger if you're tagging content with this sort of thing. So uh, there is also a plugin that allows you to mine keywords from things and also allows you to create uh, word clouds on any taxonomy terms you have that are highly connected in the rest of your taxonomy. So there's some other cool things that you can do with that. But um, in a general sense, if you just need to use this to manage a taxonomy and then ship it to somebody else. Another thing that I did forget to mention is um, you don't have to start everything from scratch. There is a way to um, upload an Excel document so you can just start with your Excel documents already. And that's a little bit more of a process. So I might save that for another video. The other thing is you can just create a class hierarchy in here where you would say, uh, cat, oops, uh, mitten, uh, and then 
kittens. I don't know why that's my taxonomy here, but I'm going to add it. Finish. And you can see here, because I was sitting on this pizza, that is where the, the system put in my hierarchy that I just created. So that's another way that you can go in and, and add some things uh, faster, because I know that's, that's some of the criticism for it. All right, and to finish it out, you can always save this as any of these different syntaxes, right? So you can parse out XML, you, you can parse out any of these actually. A lot of these are um, ontology formats though. So what's also helpful is if you go up to tools and export to CSV and there we go, replace. And here you just want to make sure that you grab all the information of your, of your doc. Um, so, I mean, you could add, add, there we go, there we go. These won't matter because they're restrictions. So let's go down here and add all this just to even it out. Okay. And let's open it up and take a look. And here you can see is your beautiful CSV of taxonomy with all of its metadata. So if you just wanted to use this as um, a better way than Excel <laughs> to, to do some things, um, maybe automate, maybe to kind of add some data governance in to keep you on track, and then you export this and send it off to whoever needs it, that is another way to go. All right, so I really hope that has helped you see all of the beauty that you can get from Protege for the taxonomy management. As I mentioned in the beginning, this is absolutely not the only way to do it. There's a lot of other tools that have a lot of other functionality, but if you are looking for a taxonomy management tool, Protege, I don't hear a lot of people talk about it in this respect, but I've used it for this reason a ton in my life. And so I wanted to share that with all of you. And if you have any pros or cons of using this yourself, please leave it in the comments below. So with that, I want to thank you very much and I'll catch you next time.